king Come let us bow at his feet He has done great things Yeah See what a savior has done See how his love overcomes He has done great things Yes He has done great things See it out church Oh hero of heaven You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God My name is Ted Canaris, and I want to welcome you to Community Online. Today, we'll be starting a series called Naturally Supernatural, and I wholeheartedly believe that God wants to expand our understanding of who He is and what He can do through this series. Just like the song we just sang, I am expecting great things. And before we go any further, I would love for you to share the link via text or social media with your friends and your family members. We'd love for them to join us, and your invitation can make that happen. And if you're new to community, welcome. And I want to encourage you to text the word HELLO to 331-226-1686 to access and fill out our online communication card. We'd love to learn your name and reach out to you in the next couple days to share more about our church. 
And don't forget, you can also reach out to our prayer team during this service by texting the word PRAY to that same number or by clicking the prayer button. Our prayer team is standing by and ready to pray for you. If we look back a year ago to the early days of the pandemic, our church formed teams under the umbrella of Community Cares to reach the immediate needs of our communities. The mission of Community Cares is to provide relief by meeting the immediate needs of our communities, to develop people through nurturing relationships, and to work towards holistic transformation in the areas of education, race, poverty, and incarceration. Community Cares provides an opportunity for all of us to give back and to grow in being the church. This month, you can sign up for Summer Serve, which takes place throughout the week of June 21 through the 26th, and we're mobilizing 350 volunteers for projects all throughout Chicagoland, and we need your help. So head to communitychristian.info to sign up for our project today. In a few minutes, our lead pastor, Dave Ferguson, is gonna bring us the first message in this new series. But first, let's take some time to give back to God. God has entrusted each one of us with resources that he calls us to use wisely for his kingdom. And when we give back to God, we're investing in the work that God is doing in this world and we're joining him in furthering his mission. I wanna encourage you right now to do just that. You can give through the community app or by texting the word GIVE to 331-226-1686 or by clicking on the Give button. You can also send a check to our mailing address in Naperville. And as you give, let's hear all about our new 3C communities from community pastor Rodrigo Cano in today's Be the Church moment. Hello community. I am super excited about our 3C communities. A 3C community, it's a group of people who meet together to celebrate, connect, and contribute. It's a full but smaller expression of community Christian church, where people meet, where they live, where they play, and where they work, even in a place like this, and they share the big idea, and they have conversations about faith. Last month, we were able to commission and pray over people who are gonna be leading this 3C community. And we are so excited, guys. We're, you, you know it, I always express it to you. We're so excited for you and what God's gonna do through you and, and with you. Father God, I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you for, for each of these people who are courageously and continually wanting to follow what you have for them. Yes. And Lord, I ask that uh, really this be kind of a, a marker event for them. And in that same tradition, the way that those early Christ followers, after spending just a short amount of time, were sent out to reach people where they lived and where they worked and they played. That's exactly what we're doing here. Amen. 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 I also want to give a big shout out to our 3C community in Spanish. One already started and God is moving in powerful ways. So this is what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to pray for 3C communities to bless 3C communities, and I also want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity because it is your generosity that moves the mission forward as we are one church with four expressions. In the doctor's words, it was nothing short of a miracle, and I was healed. I was in tears as I was receiving the word from God that definitely strengthened, encouraged, and comforted me. And in my heart, I heard him respond, I know. And those two words healed so much. Hello, community. It is great to be with you, and it's so good to be part of such an exciting time in the life of our church. Uh, lately, I've been thinking about something that really has intrigued me, and it's like, why do some things go viral on social media, and some things do not. And it seems almost impossible to predict. Let me show you what I'm talking about, and let's just take a quick stroll down social media memory lane. Like, for example, um, who remembers the Harlem Shake videos in 2013? I don't want to bring back too many memories here. <laughs> um, did anybody participate in one of those videos? And if you did, are you willing to admit it? And I'll tell you what, if you did, if you have a 2013 Harlem Shake video, 
Send it to me. I will get it to our communications team, and I will do our best to put on our platforms. And we'll see if it goes viral again. All right? That was one. Or um, how about the great debate over is the dress blue or gold? Do you remember that one? 2015. Anybody think it's still blue? Me. Or 2020 was a challenging year, but it did give us another great viral phenomenon. I don't know if you remember this or not. Remember this, the standing broom? What happens, it came out on Twitter that NASA research had found out that February 10th, 2020 was the only day that a broom could stand on its own due to the Earth's gravitational pull. And sure enough, tons of people started posting amazing pictures of just their broom. It was like standing there. It was unbelievable. Now, for all you skeptics, I actually tried it myself, and would you believe it? It did. I mean, the broom just stood up on its own, and I, I was kind of surprised. Well, it turns out any broom can stand on its own on any day. It has nothing to do with Earth's gravitational pull, and NASA never said anything about it. But here's my question. Why? Why, when something like this pops up on the Internet, do so many people kind of eagerly join in? and are just amazed. I think it's because we're intrigued by anything out of the ordinary. I think there's something that's stirred inside us when we see or experience something that just can't be instantly explained or easily understood. I think all people are drawn mysteriously to the supernatural. Now, a standing broom trick is one thing. But let me ask you this. What about when it comes to more powerful supernatural acts you hear about, like a healing? What do you think then? Or miracles? Or if someone says to you, oh yeah, God told me, how do you react then? Are you kind of intrigued? Or are you skeptical? And I know for me, I'm like a mixture. I'm both kind of like intrigued and skeptical. <laughs> well, today, we're starting a brand new series. I'm really excited about this, and it's called Naturally Supernatural. Now, I know when you first hear that, naturally supernatural, it kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but let me explain why I think this phrase could be so helpful to us. Okay, first of all, natural is defined by existing in or caused by nature, not made or caused by humankind. So we understand nature because we can observe the natural. We can measure the natural. We can predict the natural because the naturally occurs over and over and over again naturally. But what about supernatural? Well, supernatural is defined as something beyond, beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. And this is where it starts to get a little blurry and a little messy. In order for something to be supernatural, it is by definition beyond the bounds of those things that we consider natural. So it's outside of that which is observable, measurable, predictable, which is why we struggle with the supernatural to understand it and why many of us just kind of quickly reject it and go like, no, no, no. But the reality is that the natural and the supernatural are actually inextricably linked. They always have been. I think they always will be. Think about this. Everything that we know Everything that you and I experience as what we call natural came to us at some point, came into being supernaturally. No matter what you believe about how the world came into existence, whether it's Big Bang or creation or anything in between, you have to acknowledge that what we now call, we call it natural, actually came from nothing. This observable, measurable, predictable world was somehow came to life and was born supernaturally. And I know it's a little bit of a, a mind bender, but here's why I think it's important for us to consider. Perhaps it's possible to be both natural and supernatural at the same time. Perhaps the supernatural is actually meant to be a part of our natural lives. Perhaps we can live supernaturally in a natural way. In fact, let me push you a little further. For those of you who have said yes to apprenticing with Jesus, as Christ followers, I believe we're supposed to live naturally supernatural lives. I mean, when Jesus came to earth, what happened? 
God supernaturally steps into the natural world that he created. And a cornerstone piece of Christian theology called the incarnation is the idea that Jesus is both fully man, but he's also fully God. He, he's perfectly natural, but also perfectly supernatural. And because Jesus is our model for how to fully live, he actually models for us a life that was naturally supernatural. As German missionary Reinhard Bonnke, he put it this way, he said, Christianity is either supernatural or nothing at all. Supernatural or nothing at all. See, Jesus lived in the natural, but if we follow his life everywhere he went, he also ushered in the supernatural realities of the kingdom of God. He was constantly at work, supernaturally restoring this broken world. Uh, the gospel writer Matthew wrote the first biography of Jesus. He describes Jesus' ministry this way. Look at this. He says, what Jesus did, he went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. If following Jesus means that we're to do what he did, then naturally supernatural is a perfect description of the life we're called to live as Jesus' apprentices. But, I mean, let's be honest, but for many of us, the supernatural, when we start talking about supernatural, that feels, I mean, that feels way, way out of our comfort zone. When it comes to this part of our faith, I think a lot of us, we have some fears, we have some doubts, we have some reservations, and some of us have had some bad experiences. Some bad experiences. So I think it's important that we acknowledge right from the start here, there are ways that supernatural things like hearing from God, or someone says this is a prophecy, or they talk about healing, they can be and have been misused and even abused. I start thinking about this. I, I, I think that's part of the reason I don't, I don't, I have seldom if ever watched Christian TV because it, it seems like it shows up there. So we don't really know if we can believe it because we can't trust it. And it, it feels outside of what we think is possible. And for some of us, the supernatural, it just it doesn't quite fit in our box. So during this series, we're going to actually challenge one another to expand, and I love this, what we're calling our uh, plausibility structure. Big term, but hang with me on this. You're going to like this. We've illustrated a plausibility box, our plausibility structure, with this box right here. At the center is our relationship with God. The box represents our assumptions about how God will actually work in our lives and in our world. Now, whether we recognize it or not, we tend to, big or small, box God into our understanding of what is plausible. So we expect God. For example, inside the box, um, we might expect God inside the box. We expect God to hear our prayers. Um, we also expect God inside this box to forgive our sins. It's interesting, as supernatural as this is, we expect God to someday get us to heaven. A lot of us, right? That are Christ followers. But then we might put out here, we don't expect God to speak to us. We don't expect God to heal us or use us to heal other people. We don't expect God to ever do miracles in our lives or through us. See, we don't expect him to work beyond these boundaries that, let's be honest, we created. And for many of us, the thought that we might regularly experience supernatural activity of God, it's just, it's, it lies way outside the boundaries, the box of what seems plausible. And I'll tell you, I totally get it. Because I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to me because I have a box. I have a box for what's plausible. Along the way, though, there have been events and I think occasions that have kind of expanded <laughs> my box. I remember one of the first, one of the first times I was, I think I was 25, I was playing basketball in a church league. And uh, the team that we were playing against was from a local Pentecostal or charismatic church. Now, if you don't know what that means, Pentecostal or charismatic, that just means this is a church where actually their box for what God could do was much bigger than mine. They believed that miracles could happen. They believed in healing. They believed in supernatural. So that's the team we're playing, this charismatic Pentecostal church in basketball. Anyway, we're playing hoops. I remember the guy 
somebody on my team passed me the ball. I got the ball, and I remember I'm driving to the basket on my right side. I get past my guy, and I go up for the layup. And as I go up for the layup, I come down, and one of their guys from the other team comes underneath me. I land awkwardly on top of him, and I hear and feel this pop. I mean, it's just pop in my knee. Now, I, I played basketball in high school and college, and I never felt anything like that. I was immediately rolling on the ground, I mean, in excruciating pain. And I didn't really care who knew it. I mean, it was bad. The next thing that happens is all the guys from the other team, this Pentecostal charismatic church, all of them make a circle around me right there on that basketball floor. A couple of their guys reach down and lay their hands on my knee while I'm holding it. And they all start praying for me to be healed. Right there in the middle of this basketball game. Okay, this is so way outside of my plausibility box, right? I'll never forget what happened next. Instantly. I'm telling you, instantly. That's the only way I know how to explain it. The pain in my knee, it disappeared. I mean, I felt fine. So much so, I remember I actually interrupted their prayer. They were praying for me to be healed. I interrupted their prayer because I was laughing, and I told them, I said, hey, you guys had better stop praying like that or I'm going to start believing like you do. <laughs> and something happened for me where all of a sudden my box for what God might do began to expand and get bigger. Um, recently I was, uh, well, it's been a few years ago now, a couple years ago now because I've been there a few times. I was in Stavanger, Norway. Uh, the pastor there is a guy named Martin Cave, great guy. He grew up in the Lutheran tradition. Now, in the Lutheran tradition, they actually, their box is probably actually smaller than mine. They have a very small plausibility box in which they think God will actually do things. But over the years, uh, Martin continued to learn more and more about the ministry of Jesus. In fact, as he studied, he actually became an expert on the ministry of Jesus, and he eventually wrote a book about it. And the book that he wrote actually had three sections to it. And he talks about the three different parts of Jesus' ministry. And he says that there was one part was just compassion, how he loved people. The second part of his ministry was teaching, how he told people truths, life-changing and eternal truths. And the third part was miracles, that he actually did the supernatural. Now, for Martin, rather than just keeping God in this little box, over the years, he would try to minister to do things the way Jesus did. Love, compassion, teaching, truth, miracles, supernatural. So it got to the point where at their church services, at the end of the church service, they would have people come forward for prayer. And they didn't really do anything weird. They just would pray asking God for a miracle. And he told me people started getting healed amazing things started happening. Supernatural things started happening. Happening. Uh, I got to be there on, on several occasions, and uh, I got to meet some of the people. I got to hear some of the stories. And that was remarkable. But what was even more remarkable was that when they realized that what Jesus did is he used healings and miracles to build up the faith of other people. So what they did is they actually started praying for people in the town square in Stavanger. Stavanger, Norway, the downtown kind of area where people go shopping and out to eat. And again, it was nothing weird. What they would do, and just kind of imagine with me, they would have this like rented little tent like you might for a picnic that they would set up. They'd have a few folding chairs. They'd have a water cooler in case someone needed something to drink. And then they hung this simple banner on the tent, big bold letters that just said, need prayer, question mark. <laughs> That's it, need prayer, question mark. And people who were out shopping or people were going out to eat or people were just hanging out and me meandering downtown Stavanger would sometimes stop right there and go like, yeah, would you pray about this? Would you pray for me regarding that? And they would pray for them. And people in that town square had miraculous things happen. In fact, Martin told me, he said, it was fascinating because they began to kind of observe, but that what they saw was two to three times more miracles in the town square than they did in the church. <laughs> two to three times more in the town square than the church. And I, I share both those stories with you because every time I have one of those experiences, it just expands my plausibility structure, my box. 
Now, let me also be clear about this, okay? This is going to be important to say this. This series is not, it's not, 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 it's not about chasing after miracles. It's not trying to force, you know, the supernatural, like we're trying to make something happen that shouldn't happen. Here's the heart behind this series. And it's to ask ourselves this. What if there is a dimension to our relationship with God that many of us are missing out on? Do you want to miss it? What if God wants to work supernaturally in a way that can't be explained by your own logic? And what if God wants to do something that's, you know, outside our boxes? As a church, we don't want to miss out on the amazing things that God wants to do in us and through us. And I think for every one of us individually, we want to experience everything God has for us. Yes, His love. Yes, His truth. But also the supernatural. Now, I find it interesting that even the early church, they also, that first church, they struggled with the supernatural. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he expresses the exact same concern for the Corinthian church that I'm sharing with you today, that some of them were missing out on the supernatural. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, notice how he starts the conversation. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. That's how he starts the conversation. It seems there were those in the church at Corinth who were uninformed about the supernatural gifts. And there was a lot of confusion about their purpose. I mean, some in the church were trying to elevate those gifts as way more important than others. Some were accusing others of blasphemy. I mean, the whole, it was just a mess. And so Paul is, is writing. He wants to clear up things because he could see that they were missing out on what God wanted to do in them and also through them. And I think the same thing could be true in our day and also in our church. Now, it can be a danger if we make too much of this. But it can also be dangerous if we deny the existence of the supernatural or remain, like the Corinthians, uninformed. And we miss out on everything God wants to do. So Paul goes on and teaches the Corinthians about these supernatural gifts. Here's what he says next. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of services, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. The first thing that Paul wants them to know very clearly is, is this. God is the power behind these supernatural gifts. It's not us, it's God. It's all about, it's His power. And then he answers the question, well, why are they given? He goes on, he says, well, to each one, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, here's the clincher, for the common good. The gifts are given for the benefit of the whole community to build up our faith. The gifts are not given to elevate a single individual, but instead to elevate the community. And so when it comes to these supernatural gifts, it, it, it's we, okay, not me. It's we, not me. And so then Paul goes on and he actually lists these supernatural gifts. <clears throat> and, we, and we see it in these verses here. Now, you can take a look here, but a couple things about this list. First of all, this is not the only list of gifts that appears in the New Testament. So this is not meant to be exhaustive. This is some of them. Second thing that's important in this list here in Corinthians, Paul addresses what are considered the more supernatural gifts, because that's his topic. Remember, his aim for the Christ followers is to practice these supernatural gifts the right way in a natural way. Now, for our purposes, what I want to do is quickly, and you can go back and look at these, look at these supernatural gifts in three different groupings, three different groups. Uh, the first group is what you might call um, gifts of revelation. Gifts of revelation. Now, these gifts would include supernatural wisdom and knowledge. Gifts of revelation bring to mind thoughts, ideas, insights to people that would be absolutely unknowable without God giving it to them, without God's help. Okay, that's the gifts of revelation. The second group that you see here are what we call um, gifts of power. Now, these include healings and miracles. The gifts of power demonstrate God's power in miraculous, okay, supernatural, outside the boundaries of what's normal, predictable, right? Miraculous ways through signs and wonders. They cannot be explained naturally. That's the gifts of power. Then he has a third group. And we'll call this the gifts of speech. And these gifts include like prophecy or tongues, interpretation of tongues. Gifts of speech communicate God's truth, maybe about the present, 
or the future in supernatural ways that, that bring faith to people or maybe a warning to people or encourage people. And here's the thing, in the same way that Paul asked the Corinthians, hey, be open, be open to God working supernaturally. That's the challenge I have right at the outset of this series. I want us to open ourselves up to how God might want to work both in you and in our community supernaturally. And so to start with, I want to go back to the plausibility structure that I introduced at the beginning. Okay, we all have one of these. We all have a plausibility structure in our relationship with God. But I want you to begin to think critically about how your existing structure has shaped. How did it get to be the size that it is? How did it get to be maybe misshaped? How has it grown or shrunk in light of your own experiences, your own life? And let's, let's try to be really um, vulnerable and honest with ourselves. How might we have boxed God in? If our desire is to know God for who He really is, then we need to allow God to expand our view of God to include all that He wants to do. So here's the challenge I'm putting before you right now during, and throughout this series, okay? Let's let God out of the box. <laughs> let God outside of your box. Expand your plausibility structure. And I'm challenging you not to merely open yourselves up to the possibility that you can experience the supernatural activity of God in your day-to-day -day life. That's kind of one thing. I want, to, I want to go further than that. But I want you to recognize that you were meant to. You were meant to experience it. Now, here's where we're going to go during this series. There's four ways. There's four ways during this series we want to actually kind of expand your plausibility structure. All right? First of all is through theology. We want to deepen your understanding of God's supernatural activity that is found in Scripture. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to study the Bible. And guess what? As you do that, there is a ton of supernatural stuff in here. we got to figure out how do we explain that? And, and why isn't it showing up now? And maybe it should. Second is through testimonies. You're going to hear stories of how real people have experienced God's supernatural activity in their lives. And you know what? Just like what happened with me when you experienced that, it's going to expand your box. And I'll tell you, for me, as I get a chance to interact with the global church, I'm talking about global leaders and even people from other parts of the world that are Christ followers, their box, for many of them, not all places, but a lot of places, their box is bigger than ours. And it's not because they have a different God. It's just because they have a different understanding of how God can work. So we'll have testimonies. We're also going to talk about tactics. We're going to give you practical instructions on how you can engage with God in supernatural activities, how you can hear from Him, how you can pray for other people. I think we can naturally, without being weird, bring the supernatural into our lives. And then lastly, okay, through trust. I want to help all of you overcome your fears and your doubts to believe that God desires to act in supernatural ways both through you and, and, and through me. And when He does it, He does it for our good and He does it out of love. And I'll tell you, here, here's why I'm so excited. Here's what I'm looking forward to. As we learn, as we hear, as we practice, as we see God work in supernatural ways, here's what's going to happen. Our plausibility structures are going to expand. Your relationship with God is going to grow. And as each of our plausibility structures expand, the naturally supernatural impact of our church is going to expand in our communities, and people are going to find their way back to God. I'm going to, here's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, make it a priority to join us for all four parts of this series and come ready to be challenged. Because if there's more for us to experience in our relationship with God, I mean, let's go for it. Author Gary Best, he describes it this way. He says, if we're simply willing to try to see what God is doing and take the risk of reaching out to put our, hand, reaching out to put our hands with His, anything can happen. A miracle is potentially within our reach at any moment. And here's what I love. It's all about God's power. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter how well or poorly we speak. It doesn't matter how brilliantly we perform. If we happen to catch a hold of what God is desiring to do, all of heaven can break loose. So let's all of us, let's reach out our hands to God and let's let heaven break loose. Here's what I'm going to do in part one. I, just, I want to close with a prayer that I hope you'll begin to pray every day. And it's a prayer to help us become naturally supernatural. And, and, and the prayer is this, God, expand my vision, 
embolden my heart, release your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to ask you just to pray that prayer with me right now um, on the count of three. All right? Just out loud, wherever you are. One, two, three. God, expand my vision, embolden my heart, and release your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. In Psalm 136, the psalmist declares, Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Our God is a God who does great wonders. His supernatural activity in our world awakens us to the reality of his presence and his love. And in these next few moments, as we prepare to receive communion, let's ask God to awaken us to his presence and to his love. Let's invite him to move among us in supernatural ways. He is the God of wonders. His power has no end. May we experience more of him as we lift our praises to the God of revival.
every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains hit the ground Oh God of revival pour it out Today, as we receive communion together, may we remember the greatest supernatural event the world has ever seen, Jesus risen from the dead. He is our King, our allegiance is to Him. So let's remember Him as we receive the bread, His body given for you and for me. The cup his blood shed for you and for me. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray that today, as we again are reminded of your goodness, of your greatness, and your ability to do so much more than we could ever dream or imagine, that you would expand our hearts, you would expand our minds, You would expand our dreams for what you want to do in us and through us. And that we could together deepen our relationship with you and impact the world around us in a naturally supernatural way. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we wrap things up today, let me just echo Dave's challenge and encourage you to be here for all four weeks of this series as we allow God to expand our plausibility structure. I believe that as we do, the naturally supernatural impact of our church will expand and our relationship with God will deepen. And as always, you can find out everything happening at Community by visiting communitychristian.info. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you right back here next week at Community Online.